Welcome back to Motion Finance, your one-stop spot for the latest economic news in the world, explained in the most relatable way possible. Well, today, we'll be talking about a not-too-good situation the second-largest economy in the world is struggling with right now, China. Listen, there's no doubt that China's economy is currently suffering and trying to keep up. Just like me, everyone, especially expert economists, expected growth to surge after Chinese President Xi Jinping ended the country's zero-COVID policy. But that didn't happen. Instead, the deeper mess the country is in became even more obvious. Or, let's say, worse. So, we are forced to think, what exactly is the cause of China's stagnation? Well, to be honest, we have several forces at play here. But one of the most excruciating is oil. Yes, China is facing a severe oil crisis. They do not have much oil left, and things aren't looking to get any better. Of course, many other countries globally are suffering a similar fate. But China? This is beyond tolerable, as it's hitting hard on its economy already. Remember when the Evergrande crisis extensively shook through the Chinese financial system? Well, if care isn't taken, we might be suffering almost the same fate again. It looked like it was just yesterday that oil analysts, ministers, and company executives were optimistic about the Chinese oil situation, reveling about the return of a strongly bullish oil market. Several months later, we are sadly in a state where the Chinese crude oil market is struggling. Consequently, China's economic growth has slowed. And if this progression continues, the world's second largest economy might risk slipping into recession. Recently, a government minister, the Minister of Land and Resources, Wang Min, openly admitted that China is facing a significant shortage of oil and other natural resources that is ultimately limiting the country's present and future economic development. The picture is clear. But really, what is happening? Let's travel back in history a bit. Since the mid-1990s, China has undoubtedly been a major buyer of multiple commodities globally, using them to power its economic growth. The primary reason for this growth was to create and enlarge a maintainable and controllable middle class. And yes, China achieved this. In fact, they grew so much, as we all know, to become the second largest economy in the world. To put this into a clearer perspective, China had a GDP of less than $150 billion in 1978. But by 2012, the country's GDP had increased to over $8,000 billion, and of course, continued to grow since then, establishing a superpower counterpoint to the global south to rival that of the United States in the global north and ultimately become the number one superpower in the world. Well, with the current situation surrounding China, we may never get to experience this. Anyway, back to it. Thanks to this stellar economic growth span across many years, the prices of these commodities that China continued to purchase also continued to get expensive, more than they ever needed to be. Oil is one of these important commodities. And with the emergence of COVID and the resulting policy to contain it, things became even more severely impacted. And now, every single one of us is at a crossroads. China has continued to shift its core economic growth model, which has also somehow contributed to the crisis. From 1992 to 1998, the country's annual economic growth rate was basically between 10 to 15%. From 1998 to 2004, it was between 8 to 10% and grew to 15% again from 2004 to 2010. See, for much of the period from 1992 to the middle 2010s, much of China's massive economic growth was founded on a huge energy-intensive expansion of its manufacturing capabilities, which included the mass migration of new workers from the countryside into the cities, which required a huge energy-intensive infrastructure build-out. Even after some of China's growth began to switch to the less energy-intensive service sectors, the country's investment in energy-intensive infrastructure build-out remained very high. This pattern continued for many years, alongside the third phase of China's economic growth, which I explained earlier, which was the rise of a middle class, which significantly powered domestic consumption-led demand for goods and services. All these phases had the net result of increasing China's demand for oil and gas exponentially. 
So in summary, China has grown from being an agricultural country into a fully mechanical one, constantly manufacturing, restructuring, and basically engaging in activities that would require using oil. In 1993, China became a net importer of oil after producing just 1.2 million barrels of petroleum, while its national demand stood at 1.7 billion barrels. Since then, its import rate has continued to grow as its oil dependency continues to increase. Now that the country is running out of its reserves, the big question is, how will China survive? Well, it is easy to think, what about Russia? Well, to a considerable extent, this is true. I mean, Russia is the world's third largest oil producer and has the largest reserves of natural gas. And considering how close Russia and China's presidents are, alongside the similarities the two countries share in their free market-oriented reforms and how they both react and address general global affairs, it is easy to think that Russia should easily come to China's rescue in this season of energy crisis. But to be honest, it really isn't as easy as you think. Yes, they undoubtedly fit politically, but economically, the puzzles aren't connecting. First, the oil industry of Russia itself is experiencing a deep depression. In fact, in the last 10 years, it has suffered an almost 50% slump alongside decreasing oil prices. Russia's crisis can be described as more systemic. Most of the oil wells in the European part of Russia have been operational since the early 1970s, and most of them are now depleted and would require serious and costly technological renovation in order to resume output equal to the previous level. But whether systemic or not, we can clearly see that it isn't in the best position to lend a helping hand at the moment. Another obstacle is that the Russian oil and gas industry is traditionally oriented toward the Western market and consequently lacks the necessary refinery and transport infrastructure to support its eastern axis where China is situated. This creates a bottleneck that doesn't only affect China, but also leads to major energy shortages within the Russian Far East. And when experts considered creating new oil fields in this axis, particularly in Siberia, they realized the production costs were far above any reasonable level and immediately aborted the thoughts. All of these tell us one thing. China cannot seriously consider Russia to supply them with oil in the near future to support the country's energy crisis. More importantly, thinking beyond the surface, we may also want to say that China might be reluctant to add energy dependency to its already existing security and political affiliations with Russia especially knowing that the more China's reliance on Russian oil deepens, it may draw major diplomatic pressure, or at worst, severe sanctions from the West, which may further deteriorate China's economic stability and overall international relations. Do you see how messed up Russia's international relations are right now? Trust me, China won't want to have that added to their sinking economy. See, this oil crisis is affecting China in places that hurt the most cutting across several sectors, including finance. And it is even worse to think of knowing that there are basically no solutions in sight yet. The impact of the property crash was enormous, affecting everything from local government revenues to the market for basic raw materials like iron ore, oil, and asphalt, and suppliers of everything from lamps and furniture to household appliances. See the consequences as a slowly killing poison a ticking time bomb that no one knows precisely when it will explode. Things look perfectly okay on the surface as China continues to set the pace, especially in the manufacturing and transportation sectors, the two sectors that every developing country must pay critical attention to. However, now it seems China has bitten more than it can chew as its supposed blessings are slowly turning into a curse. So, the big question now is, where do we go from here? To get a clearer understanding of the situation in China, don't hesitate to check out the video on your screen, where I comprehensively discussed what exactly is happening in the background as China's economy continues to collapse. But before you go, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the notification bell so you will be among the first to know when I publish next. Thank you for watching, and bye for now.